and they can't take it that the interaction is so fast and what they call non-local. It doesn't propagate. It really doesn't take time to go anywhere. It doesn't go through anything. It does nothing you can affect it with. So it must be affected by something and made various predictions of what it might be affected by and then would propose experiments that you would do, have to do to check out whether or not this magic force was uh, doing it the slightly different thing they wanted it to do than to be perfect, okay? And these experiments that have been proposed never work so far. Now you say, oh, well, I can certainly invent one which works over the entire range that's so far been checked, if I'll tell you what it is, <laughs> right? You can just make the rules so that it'll go further on, that it'll happen only one light year apart. You've got to move these a light year apart or you'll never see any effect. Okay, we can't do that experiment. It's still possible. You could have it if you wanted but there's no evidence for it, and all attempts of this kind to make those suggestions, which were not stupid, because this is so peculiar, it might have been that the prejudice about the way the world worked that you had previously was in fact right, and that there was some delay in the interaction. It's a good suggestion, only it isn't so far true. So, so what we do in physics is we take what we find so far and try to extrapolate it to see uh, over a wide range of experience to see if it works. It's always possible that the theories be wrong, that there really is an interaction, that this really doesn't work what I told you with the two boxes when they're a light year apart or some other distance. It's always possible. We're not trying to find out for certainty what the world is like, but just what we've seen so far. And we can summarize everything that we've seen so far by saying that this interaction is instantaneous and magical and does exactly what we want to get the answer over here, okay? And so we just don't talk, worry about it yet, because we have seen no effects on various things. People, however, are aware of the possibilities and are making suggestions for experiments, but so far all of those experiments have failed. My personal opinion is that they're all going to fail, that the logic is wrong, that there was the prejudice that you had, a rather deep one, of course, uh, about the potentialities for what's going to happen before you push, that that must mean something, that the chicken in or out of the icebox has got to mean something. There's the only two possibilities, but that logic is wrong. I think that's really the way the world is, that our ideas that came from experience in the large-scale world are that wrong, that uh, that's all it is. But that's a, an opinion held by most physicists and perhaps incorrect, but uh, we'll find out someday if the thing doesn't work. So far, it works. So let's talk about so far, okay? I'll show you how we have to think logically, yes. Yes. We have to just be careful not to make some statement like, see, it isn't the fundamental logic, like you say, I'm going to assume a variable x can have two values. That's not what we're saying. We're saying there is a piece of chicken in an icebox or else it isn't. But we're not going to start to talk about what's in unless we open a door. Such ideas may not mean anything. It may not be an inside to the icebox, much less whether it's lit or not. <laughs> as soon as you close the door, there's no inside <laughs> or whatever. So it's not logic, it's a question of what you're going to allow yourself to talk about. So you're being rigorously operational. Yes, yes it has to be more operational. The, yeah. the other point that the uncertainty principle makes uh, causality irrelevant. Because since you mm -hmm. can't determine the present... No, no, you can. If you measure the, whether this is a red light or not, you, it's perfectly all right. It's just that attempting to measure another thing about the present simultaneously changes what you found before. Yeah, but you have to know where you are and where you're going in order to determine where Yes. Ah, oh, to determine exactly. But you remember how I said that uh, there would be probabilities, that the, we're not able to predict the future exactly. We only predict the probability of different events. And if you want to say uh, that, you see, we're not in a situation where we know this present and that determines exactly the future because it's not the way it appears to be. We can set up the present as perfectly as we want and the future becomes uncertain. It's only probabilistic. So it's consistent with the thing. Oh, okay. now, now, just to continue with this identification of words, all right? It was Einstein, after uh, Heisenberg talked about the uncertainty principle of position and momentum measurements, uh, most physicists understood it and everything okay and took this point of view. But uh, Einstein uh, and Podolsky and Rosen didn't like it particularly and they wrote a paper saying they didn't like it. And that's what it amounts to. What they didn't like, they took 
the analog of this experiment, except for position and momentum measurements. They pointed out it was possible to get two particles separated. So by measuring the momentum of one of them, you would know ahead of time by the correlations that that would determine the momentum of the other, just like. If we push this button here, it would be just equivalent to pushing that button there, because they're always agree. So you could make a pair of objects so that the momentum of this would always agree with the momentum of that. Actually, the momentum were opposite directions, but that's technical. You could put it through a mirror. You could make it so the momentum of this would always be the same as the momentum of that, and the position of this would always be the same as the position of that. So you measure the momentum of this one and the position of that one. And that was against the uncertainty principle, they said, because by measuring the position of this one, surely you can't be changing the thing over there. And Heisenberg would have said in the older way of speaking, if I would be crude, that by measuring the momentum, you jiggle and make unpredictable the position because of some mechanical effect. We have to deny that now. We have to, we can't just say it's a mechanical effect, as we now notice, that we can't say, it's easy to understand if you push this, you might have some wheels turning to change that. But if you push this, you have wheels turning over here to change that? No. So they just pointed out this little difficulty that uh, you can't take the classical point of view that a particle has a position. In, well, that if you measure the position, that there is a position of momentum. When you measure the momentum, you change the position. That's too crude because you can measure the momentum of this other one and that you can't, it won't change the position of that one. It's, it's just, this is a completely analogous. It's an example of an einstein podolsky rosen setup. The idea is that by measuring over here, where it's practically inconceivable that this could be affecting that, you get, uh, you can determine what this would have been if you didn't push it. But we don't like to talk about what it would have been if we don't push it anymore. That's the way we escape from that. And it was already known by the time Einstein and Podolsky wrote that, that that was what people were saying. But they were objecting to that, and they said that that's not an adequate description of, of reality. Or perhaps it's not an adequate description of reality, but it's an adequate description of whatever we are able to predict. And people who have tried to increase the reality of this by making this a real wave or something like that have always produced predictions which don't agree with experiment. So that's where it stands. And that's now we've talked about the uncertainty principle and Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen. All they said was there was such a situation, which we've already used. Uh, did you have a question? Yes. Always, I've always been impressed by the fact that I've not seen very many comments on the, the philosophical premises laid down by EPR, which is if I can predict something with complete certainty, there's an element of reality that I can attribute. Yeah. And basically, what you're saying is that's the piece of the action that you have to let go of. That's to right. The dilemma. That's right. You've got that. Yeah. yeah just, just because I can measure. Yes. Right. Classical reality Finally, is fixed, and, and this reality is not. It's a different kind of reality. The world has to look different. Yes. Is that what you were saying, too, that it's not a matter of the logic yet, yeah, that we have not the new logic, but that right now we have to let go of the assumptions or of the ways? Yes. We there are two about. ways always of doing it. Uh, when something doesn't work. You can either say that you were not allowed to make certain steps of logic or to make certain perfectly obvious assumptions that look perfectly reasonable. Both of them are difficult because we don't like either of them. The logic looks good. There's two ways of doing it. The easiest way and the way that we've all chosen for practice, in practice, is to say the lo you can do as much logic as you want, but you've got to be very careful about the kind of assumptions that you make about what's real and what's there especially about potentialities. The whole thing is summarized this way. You can't say that this thing has the potential for producing red, green, and green. That's there before you won't push to check it, OK? Uh, Wheeler has said, in a way, it's a, it, it, one of these beautiful aphorisms that are shorthand, which you can only understand after you've finally, finally understood the whole, oh, you want me to wait a minute for your tape? Okay? Uh, I, uh, Wheeler has made one of those lovely aphorisms to describe this, which you'll only really understand thoroughly when you understand the whole thing. <laughs> but uh, it helps to remember. He says, there's no phenomenon. A phenomenon is not a phenomenon until it's an observed phenomenon. In other words, you can't tell what's happening in there, or there's no chicken, or there isn't chicken, until you look to see. So you only talk about what you can look to see.
Wheeler. Wheeler, John Wheeler. Who said oh. We're away from probability. I don't know. Is that really? Uh, maybe. I don't know. And then finally, in the list of uh, things that are in the prospectus for this workshop, care there was Bell's theorem. Huh? Taking care of all that business. Yeah, I want to take care of the business. I advertise something, and I have to show you that I've already done it. <laughs> Another one is Bell's theorem. I've already told you about that, I think. And uh, that says uh, is simply a mathematical statement of the fact that situations like this can arise where the actual probabilities observed are impossible to explain by a classical type of uh, card-filling boxes scheme. If the odds had been two-thirds that we would get a different color and not three-quarters, we could have explained it easily with all this logic would be OK. But that in quantum mechanics, some of the probabilities that would be predicted by quantum mechanics would disagree with the simple arguments in a situation like that, like this, that you get by thinking about cards being in the box. In other words, quantum mechanics would produce effects like this. The mathematical theorem is more complete. It tells you how much the effects are and where to look for them. But we have an example of such an effect, and that's all we need to show that something that quantum mechanics is odd. You don't also need a theorem to tell you how odd it's going to be in every case, which is what the theorem was. Okay? The theorem was in fact inspired by such discussions of this for special examples. And not quite as simple as this one where we have only three measurements, but measuring spins of electrons that were correlated and so on, where you can measure something that has light, or, for, or the polarization of light, where you can measure a whole lot of different possible places. It's if we had boxes with lots and lots of buttons. The point would be that some of the odds on the buttons were against the common sense. <laughs> Old-fashioned common sense, yes. I was just going to point out that, that actually Bell's description is very much like this description in the sense that you, in, in his setup, you actually do have to look at three different uh, polarizer settings in order to get the inequality, just, just as you have to have the three buttons. That you need at least three before you get into trouble. You can show that there's no situation where you can measure just two things yeah. where the probabilities are not something that you could imitate with cards. So that's why it involves three in his theory. Yes. Well, there because, uh, yes, where the thing is done general, or you have a special example, there must always be a parallel between a general theorem and a special example of a kind. And in fact, uh, I personally find different people are different. Some people think abstractly right away very well. I don't. I always have to have examples to understand something the first time I hear it, and then I kind of generalize from the examples. Other people like the general thing and then try to use it on examples. So I like this way of thinking of things, a nice, simple example where all the things are perfectly clear and there's not a lot of mathematical stuff that confuses me. Well, it works if I study hard, I can sort of check out. In fact, what I do is the opposite. I take the mathematical scheme and try to find a case like this. I didn't find this one. I found one with six buttons. Okay, I mean, my original one was more complicated than this one of Merman, which is beautiful, beautifully simple. Mine had six buttons. It was almost the same, actually, but it wasn't quite as good. Can you give us a practical uh, application of Bell's theorem, the way you talk about the sunset and the moon? No. No. <laughs> no, we've talked about it. There's nothing magical about it. It's just a mathematical statement that there are situations in the world where you make measurements like this which will have this kind of paradoxical probability answers, you know? The answers will be not understandable by supposing it was done with cards that were shifted and stuff like that, okay? That this kind of a thing can happen. That's all it is. It's a statement that this kind of a thing can happen. Who added this non-local reality idea? I don't know about non-local reality, what? Who said? Huh? Who? You mean the two sets are different? Two sets of three boxes? Right. Well, well Einstein, Podolsky, and Rosen are the ones that emphasized uh, this kind of a situation. It was already known to others what would happen in this situation. In fact, they could use the mathematics of the theory that existed for this kind of situation, but they didn't like the result. And they simply said that. They said, can quantum mechanics be a complete description of reality? Because, as you pointed out, they made an assumption about reality, which was that if you could determine what was in that thing, that had to be somehow real. And if you could determine by doing something over here, which didn't affect that, 
It couldn't affect that because there was no, there no independent of distance and simultaneous and so on. Then that was somehow real there, and they wanted to make it real. They insisted, in other words, that we'd be able to say that there was some sort of potential cards in here that are determining what happens. And that's just what we don't say. So, yes? Yesterday you described the rotary process of pushing number one and it's red. Then you push number two and it's green. Yeah. Then you push number one again, it could be red. Or right. Green. But now if you go to the second box, right. it still hasn't changed number Correct. one. Correct. Although uh, number one here may have been already changed. Would it, that preclude any forces between them? In any, Operating because in a kind of way, it does, doesn't it? It yeah, means that, yes, that's true. That if you were to say in some mechanical way that when you push this, you change that, then you would think that if you kept pushing the other ones, it would keep changing that, OK? But it doesn't. Any further actions over here have nothing to do with what happens there. The only thing this is good for is permitting you to know what you would have gotten if you pushed, or rather, better, I should be careful, permitting you to predict what would happen if you push the same button, period. That's all it's able to do. After that, the first time, and after that, nothing. That's an interesting point, and uh, I have not analyzed that very carefully, and I don't know what the people who invent these waves have done with that aspect of it, okay? Why it disappears after the first measurement. It's an interesting point that I have not studied. Thank you. I'll have to look that up, into that. So that sort of helps to make it impossible. It makes these waves get more and more complicated. To explain what? A result which we can describe over here and forget about this if we wanted to. It's just that this is correlated with it. OK? So, oh, uh, I guess that takes care of all of the three things. OK, now I've, advertised, I've sold you what I advertised. <laughs> and now I would like to. Uh, well, we're not finished yet. No. OK. Uh, we can talk about a few other things. And that's this. Let me ask this question. See, you don't know what can be done and what can't be done, so I'm going to tell you something. Maybe we could make a copy of this box without bothering it. That is, we can make another box over here. Three boxes. Ooh, what a wonderful idea. Three boxes. And let's make it so that, is it possible? This also has a one, two, and three. Is it possible to make three boxes such that the following happened? That if I wanted to find out what this would do, I remember last time with two boxes, I could push that. If this is red, that'll always be red. After or before. Make it three. Then I could push this one also to determine whether this would be red. For example, if this is red, then this is red and this is red. Can we make it work with three? In other words, in nature, is it possible to arrange that there are three boxes which have the following property? I could look at any box to determine whether this was red by pushing any one of those buttons, not necessarily this one, and they'll always agree. All three boxes always agree. Likewise, if I push button two, all three boxes would always agree. Or if I push button three, they would always agree. Then we were going to get in trouble because it's it takes a little thinking, and I haven't thought it out to make it simple. But because we have another box by which we could make another measurement over here, so to speak, without touching it, we're going to find it's just, it's impossible. Now, it's not impossible simply because it's logically impossible, but I mean, it's uh, logic. But if you count the number of cases that you get, that is, you measure this box, this box here, and this box here, and then ask how many times the pairs differ they have to be a third. You see, this time I would be able to make three measurements, and I could list the three measurements. I could tell you what was one, what was two, and what was three. Now we would have, maybe it would turn out that one time it would be red, black, black. Those were the results, or green, green, I guess. Uh, those are the results of measuring three different boxes. They're all available. Another time it could be green, red, red. The three different boxes, or maybe red, red, red. Because I have an experimental situation with three boxes, and I push one button on one, button number two on the second box, button number three on the third box. So this is number one on box one, or box A. This is number two on box B. And this is number three on box C. There's nothing wrong with that. 
So here's the three boxes, A, B, and C. And remember that I, whatever I get on C would be of the same if I pushed it on A, same number. Now if I make this long list of possibilities, which are all measured now, those are numbers that are in notebooks, they're not in boxes anymore. I pushed the buttons and I wrote the answers down. Okay, after I've done this for a week and I've got thousands of these, I go back and I count, count. Nothing, has nothing to do with the boxes, nothing. I count how many times do I get a, out of all this a pair, two e pair, one pair equal and one, I gotta get at least one pair equal out of every three. See, I can think of all the, I just have to count, let me see, what do I count? I count how many times a pair that match a, appear. Then uh, here's one, it depends. How many times, okay, let's say how many times a pair match appear in the, cap, in the column one, two? Plus how many times a pair appear in the column one, three? Well, how many times in two, three? And I'm counting all the pairs. And you see there can't be any less than one third that pairs match. This is the pair that matched. In this case, these didn't. In this case, this pair matched, but the other two didn't. So I must get at least one third matches. I can't get only a quarter matches because I've written them down, that's, that's impossible. So it's impossible, therefore something would be wrong if I could do it with three boxes. And nature doesn't permit us to do it with three boxes. It's not possible to arrange in quantum mechanical world, in the real world, in other words, three boxes which have this property that if I push any one button here, I can determine what the others two would do. Any button, all right? What is possible, it's curious. What is possible is to arrange three boxes such that they all agree with hole number one, say, for instance, bo button one. I can take three boxes. In fact, I can take 3,000 boxes. I can make as many boxes as I want. Let's take three first, because you get nervous. So, so if I push button one and say it's red, it'll turn out that any of the other boxes, if I push one, it'll also be red. Right, all right? But if I push number two on this box, and it's green, say, it doesn't mean that it's green here or it's green here. It doesn't agree in general, necessarily, all right? You understand? I can make it so that this box will agree with all the other boxes if I push one. So I can use any box I want to predict what one is going to do on any of the other boxes. The first one. Number one box. I get a special arrangement. I made a special arrangement with the number one connection system, yeah where I make multiples of these boxes, say three in this case, or five if you want, but which have the wonderful property. Let, let's make a lot of them, okay? I keep doing this. You can go three, four, five, I'm jumping too fast, but you can, uh, it's the same idea. And I have a lot of boxes, and it's possible to arrange it by you, possible to get things set up. It's first position. No, first, pu first button. First button and first put, no, any number of pushes. If you, you just, uh, if you don't push it. And it came green, would all the rest of no. two C's, the first push, first be green? No, let, let, me, let me say exactly what happened. You're probably guessing right. Let me, let me just say it then. Yeah, you push one here, and it's red, let's say. Then you can predict that if you push one here, it'll be red. If you push this one, it'll be red. If you push this one, it'll be red, if it's number one hole. Okay. However. Right? If you push number two now, oh, it was one here and two there, you can't predict what it's going to be, but three quarters of the time you can guess it'll be different, okay? Nor can you predict what'll happen on this one. They won't agree. In other words, let's say I push this red, I got red, I look in this box, I push this one, it's green, okay? This does no longer have to agree with this. Uh, I can push this, it wouldn't help me to know what this is, and pushing that after I pushed one doesn't do any good. Nor, in fact, is it true this way, that if I started this out, and I know they all agree in one, by pushing two, I can find out what I would get on the others. It, no, I'm not allowed to do that. If I do that, I'd get in trouble, as I told you, because I'd make a list and I would be in trouble. A different kind of trouble, much worse, because it's on a notebook. With them. There it is, I count them, and it's impossible. Yeah. Yeah, for instance, you could make it for the other positions and you can make other kinds of correlations, but now let's say it's possible to make a perfect correlation, but only for one position, okay? A perfect correlation means that you can determine any other box by pushing one. You can only do that 
with one position. You can't do it with more than one. When there were only two boxes, we had the wondrous fact that we could do it with all three positions, correlated perfectly, but no longer, not when we try to make multiples. In fact, if you made multiples that have this property, that are all built, so you're guaranteed they've been built by the same process all the time, so that number ones all agree, which I'll call number one correlated boxes, okay? If you've arranged to make a large number of number one correlated boxes, and you don't push number one, okay? But you ask yourself, what happens if I push two? Let's say I push two on this box, it's green. And I push it on this and I record it. I push it on this and I record it. And I make a whole record of all the green, all, all number twos. Do you know what's going to happen? Not all green, no. Because if they were all green, then they would agree. And I said, I can't do that. Although I'm going to get into trouble. Yes, sir. Three of one kind and one of the other. And which kind? After you've determined for a number of these boxes, let's say you've used, you had 1,000 boxes and you used 900 to determine what it was, and it was three quarters of the time green, then you can guess. If you push this button on the other ones, it's red. And they all agree. They've been loaded. OK? You can even determine what that is by measuring the others and measuring probability. But only by probabilities. All right? This correlating many copies on the same thing is what's really called measurement. Because when we measure something, we're able to make records and write it down somewhere else, somewhere else, so that if we wanted to get the answer, we can look at the writing. So making a copy is analogous to making a record. I could play around with these boxes and throw them away, and I still find out what, I th what this one would have was by measuring this, well, any one of the boxes. They'll all agree still, the ones that are still left. So this copying process, in this particular case, a copying process which sustains the correlation in, in hole number one, or well, button number one, is called measuring what the result of one is. And the measurement of one precludes a perfect correlation in two. It insists, if you've made such a thing, that number two has three quarters of the time green and one quarter of the time red. It's saying the same thing again. Instead of making the same button measurement on the same box all the time, just making many copies. Yes? How would you just don't always use box number one as the first button you push because then there's the uh, possible confusion between the box label? The location of it and the fact that it was the first button you pushed. Oh, I see. Oh, you mean using one, two, and three, I push button one. You might be confused with whether it's the first button I pushed. In time, you mean? First in time or first on the box? Well, I'm sorry that I made that error. We could have called the buttons a PQR or something. It would have been better. Or the left button. That's a better idea. The central button than the right button. Good. OK, that's better. Now, if there was any confusion, I'll say whatever I wanted to say again. I've arranged things so that the left button is correlated. If you push it on any of the boxes, the left button will give the same answer as on any other box. Thank you. No way, because it's still, it's still the same problem. What? No, what? What's the problem? I don't understand it. 